Friday through Sunday of last week, I was with some of the men of our congregation at their annual retreat at the Mountain and Learning Center in Highlands, North Carolina. I'm in my ninth year here at UUCA, and I had never joined them before, and it was, it was about time. And so I went, and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that I did. The retreat theme was core values, or the drivers of how we think and behave, what determines our priorities, the yardstick for success in life. Frank Casper and Bailey Pope were our discussion leaders, and they used video clips to immerse us in the richness of this topic. For example, Han Solo in Star Wars, near the end, near the end of that movie, Luke invites him to join the rebels in their assault on the Death Star, but Han says no. He wants to skedaddle out of there. That's the word of the day, skedaddle. <laughs> he wanted to skedaddle out of there with all that loot that he'd earned. And it feels so bad to watch this. It's like, Han, bad choice. Don't do it, Han. But he does it. And of course, it's no wonder when we see that actually he does turn back to help his friends and that his deeper good guy impulses prevailed. When we see that, we cheer. That feels good. But then there's this question. Why did Han say no to begin with? How is it that good people can act so out of sync with the values that are dear to them? Another clip was from the movie It's a Wonderful Life. And just as with Star Wars, we men are in a circle discussing questions, linking what we see to our own experiences and, and knowings, coming back again and again to the theme of that retreat, core values. And, and in this clip, we see George Bailey, who all his life wanted to build big things. That's what he wanted to do. but. He ended up having to take over his father's leadership of the building and loan, and he never stopped lamenting this. He never stopped feeling bad about this, even as he was so good at fending off the local Scrooge, right? Harry po Henry Potter, and, and preventing Bedford Falls from falling prey to destructive values of envy and resentment, greed, bitterness. George Bailey is one complicated guy. And, and the scene we men are discussing in our circle takes place right after he has discovered the loss of the $8,000 of building and loan money and disaster and ruin are coming for him. He goes home to his sweet wife and children and a very good man starts to act very badly to the people he loves most in this world. He loses it. Despair has him in its teeth. We men in a circle watching this, we are asking, can one be living out of a core value and not recognize it? How do you expand your limited sense of who you really are? With each Subsequent film clip, we explored yet another angle on core values, more questions, so many layers to this topic. And I loved, I loved being with those thoughtful guys. I loved it. And best of all, there was no time when Frank and Bailey called a halt to all the talk, distributed a handout, and said, good try, guys. And now here are all the correct answers that have come down from on high, <laughs> handed down from on high. Good effort, guys. But we can stop thinking now. Just read what's on the handout. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. No one got a you can stop thinking now message. No one got that. The message instead was, was about how the issues of the issue of core values is fundamentally spiritual in nature. And now that we have started reflecting and discovering and discerning, well, don't stop. Don't stop. Keep on doing that. Because for all things that are spirituality related, there's never an end to questioning and wondering and discussing and discerning and exploring and discovering. The journey is lifelong and it is never ending and no one can ever say, I have arrived. 
I know all there is to Some of you look smug out there that maybe you do believe that. No, we don't believe that. Just kidding. No one looks smug out there. We never arrive. The journey goes on forever. Lots of messages I got from that, that wonderful circle of thoughtful men at the mountain this past weekend. Living out of core values brings a person into aliveness and authenticity. We Unitarian Universalists are a people of the journey, and we do not do spirituality by handout. We don't do that. Now, speaking personally, when I am brought into my aliveness, often what that looks like is me writing poetry. That's just, that's just what I do. The world and I are dancing, and i got to write about that. i gotta, I got to express that in words. There was something about that time with the men at the mountain that moved me so deeply that I found myself writing this poem. It goes like this. Fall on the mountain. Standing still, I hear the shiver of leaves on branches. I'm amazed to realize I have heard this before. Sound of gentle waves upon the shore. Ceaseless Sibilance, eternity close at hand. Then this, how they crunch as you walk upon the path and scatter them with your feet, riot of color, crimson and lemon and honey. Walking, I see a maple leaf in glorious fall color, a burst of beauty, and I want to pick it up. I want to hold it as though it were a kind of gem. I do this again and again until I'm not walking anymore, but going zigzag at a snail's pace. I'm going gaga. I'm going all woo-woo with nature. And why not? The Unitarian Universalist in me believes that a secret of the universe resides in each leaf. And if only I had the key to crack the code, if only. The beauty will have to be enough. The beauty of the turning seasons. The beauty of letting go. Beauty reflecting my own, where I am in my life cycle. How I am myself a kind of leaf. And the tree is the tree of mystery. As for the leaf, I do pick up. The only thing I have at hand to press it is my book of Mary Oliver poems. Who made the world, she writes. Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? Tell me, she says, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Right upon this, I place my prism of fall color, my fantastic leaf, and I close that book. That's the poem. Now here I am, a week later, and I'm seeing very clearly that that Unitarian Universalist space of men reflecting on core values put me into alignment with my own personal core values around the spiritual journey. And I felt the quickening. The poem was the evidence of that. And that is why I am filled with such gratitude. Gratitude for that time and for all the times that Unitarian Universal spaces have helped people connect with what is core for them. And the result is more aliveness. The result is more authenticity. There are just so many spaces in our world that do just the opposite. So many of those spaces, they sweep you up into something that might keep you really busy for a time, but in the end, you feel degraded. In the end, you feel depleted. In the end, you feel transformed into something lesser, something smaller, you, like a lizard, like the lizard in the story. Tsk, tsk, tsk. It's like this. Imagine that the sound of your soul is spirit of life. Spirit of life. Come unto me. The sound of your soul. 
but then you enter into a space where the competing sound is far different. Oh, Mickey, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blow my mind. Hey, Mickey, hey, Mickey. Sorry, Tony Basil uh, fans out there. And you can't get that thing out of your brain. You can't get some drunken monkey sound. You can't get that thing out of your brain. It's just stuck in there. It's like a broken racker. You can't get it out. And let me tell you, spirit of life, the sound of your soul, it is muffled. Spirit of life is garbled. Spirit of life is gone. That is actually why Han Solo in Star Wars momentarily considers skedaddling with all his loot rather than fighting side by side with his friends. That, oh, Mickey, you're so fine song of his greed overwhelmed him. Overwhelmed for a time his spirit of life, deeper self. Somehow spirit of life bounced back, and that is why he returned to join his friends. I want you to think of a time when an oh Mickey, you're so fine song, some variety of greed song or prejudice song or apathy song or entitlement song threatened to drown out the sweet, pure music of your soul. And Unitarian Universalism reversed that course. It brought you back to your core. I want you to think about a time. One of these times for me has been situations when the, oh, Mickey, you're so fine song is that of fear, fear. Religion as a fear-based kind of thing. Messages that basically say, if you don't get with what is on that theological handout, well, you're going to hell. I'm talking conversations with relatives around the dinner table. It is Thanksgiving. They are letting you know they are very worried for your soul. And of course, they do that because they love you, but it's about fear. They are afraid. They are afraid. Conversations in the playground between your kid and another kid, and the question is, are you saved? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> it is almost as if the God here behind the scenes is an abusive parent just waiting for an excuse to pounce. One wrong move and wham! Kablooey! What a universe to live in. What misery to live there. Compared to this, Unitarian Universalists live in a completely different universe. And our song is a totally different song. The journey is safe. This world is complicated. This world is big. This world is beautiful. This world is hurtful. It is all these things and more. And there is time enough for a person's soul to unfold at its own pace. There is room enough to explore ways of life and points of view that in the end may turn out to be unhelpful or even false. But we know that even from such things, a person can learn so much that is good. God did not put people on this earth to be afraid. God put people on this earth to be alive. Alive. Unitarian Universalism brings us back to our core. This is but one of many, many ways. Run down our seven principles. Run down each of our seven principles. Each one suggests all sorts of ways in which it does this. And what I want is more of this. More, more people whose, who's, oh, Mickey, you're so fine, broken record spiritual soundtrack is disrupted. And the sweet music of what is truly core in us comes through. And the world is made more beautiful. That is what this sermon is really about. It is about growing our faith. There was a moment when I was with the men at the mountain. And I said to myself, this is so good. Hundreds of people need to be in this room and to get in on this sweetness. Hundreds of people need to be in here and get in on this. This is so good. And what about a woman's group at UUCA? What about a woman's retreat at UUCA? What about an all-congregational retreat where we're all up here? I'm just getting delirious with visions of grandeur here. 
a vision of more and more people living into our Unitarian Universalist universe. More and more people brought into their aliveness. And maybe the result is a poem. Maybe the result is a kind word when a harsh one would have been easier. Maybe the result is an act of justice when it would have been far simpler to just turn away and pretend you didn't see what you saw. How do we get there? More and more people brought into their core. One solution is certainly an institutional one. Build the infrastructure. Build the infrastructure so that the ways and means are clear and effective. This is the path of more money, the path of improved programs, the path of renovated buildings, the path of more volunteers like, like Kay or, or Bailey or, or, or Frank or our RE guides or our musicians and on and on and on. And, and, and of course, yes, and, and in this vein, I will tell you quite plainly that plans are underway for creating that family room that we were talking about a couple weeks ago and that you might have also read about on the city. The family room idea was originally from UUCA member Dave Soleil who wrote, how about piping nice sound and video into a runaround slash social room where no one cares if my child screams with joy or fights with her sister, or cries because she gets bumped in her knee, or needs a snack, or has to go potty, or gets bored as parents. All of these things happen in every service we attend. This could actually be fun, he says, for the community, for those whose spiritual journey is loud and rambunctious and full of interruptions, for those whose journey is as much spiritual as it is social, for those who want with their spirituality lattes and donuts at the same time, for those who enjoy a blissful cacophony of the human's experience, et cetera, et cetera, let's make a joyful noise, he says, and we're going to do that, and we're going to do that. We're going to multiply the kinds of worship spaces we have in our building. We can do that. Why not? We're going to do that. So stay tuned. Hopefully that will be done by the end of the year. It's an exciting path, building the infrastructure one. That's an exciting path. But you know, it's not enough. It's not enough. For what we also need to bring to UUCA and Unitarian Universalism, for them to be truly vital, what we need to bring to them, well, it's our gratitude. It's our gratitude. Gratitude, as writer Melody Beatty has to say, unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It can turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, a stranger into a friend. That's the, isn't that a wonderful quote? Isn't that wonderful? We want the fullness of Unitarianism and Unitarian Universalism and, and, and UUCA unlocked. We want that unlocked. We want it to be a feast, a home, a friend. Gratitude is, is the way there. I say this with the film clip, It's a Wonderful Mo uh, Life in Mind, and we touched on it just a moment ago. The complete irony of that movie is that George Bailey, on the one hand, wants to build big things like bridges and skyscrapers, but he doesn't get to, and so that makes him snarky and sad. He is snarky in that movie before we even had the word snarky. He is snarky and sad all movie long. That's what it is. But you know, on the other hand, George Bailey is building big things. Not bridges or skyscrapers, but a town with a big heart and a family with big love at the center and hundreds of people in that town who are treated justly with dignity and strength and compassion. He does this work every day. He is eyeballs deep in this work, and yet there is this huge perception gap. He does not perceive the reality of how he's already doing all of the things that he's always wanted to do. It takes a supernatural intervention to turn things around. Clarence Oddbody. Angel second class. It takes a supernatural intervention 
for George Bailey to really see what is right before his eyes, right before his eyes. That is when he realizes with gratitude that he's already been living the dream. He's already been living out of his core. All along, his life has been wonderful. This is how the fullness of his life gets unlocked. And to him, it does become a feast, a home, a friend. Gratitude takes him there. So I want you to look around you. Stop looking at me. Look around you. Look at your friends. Look at the people you don't know, but they could become friends. Just to spend a little time doing that. I know it's uncomfortable for you introverts out there, I know, especially. Just, just look around you. Look at these people. Look at these people. Now, now look, at Don, look at Don Milton, our music director. Look at him. <laughs> so, look, look at Travis, who's sitting right beside Don. Look at Travis. I want you to look at me now. You look with your eyes, but I want you to look with your heart. I want you to look with your heart. We are building each other. We are building big things. We have done so in our past. We are doing so right now. You bet there are limitations, of course. You bet there are imperfections, of course. Yet, yet the things we are building, justice, kindness, a sense of wonder, a sense of awe. I think of that leaf that I picked up at the mountain. How in my poem I say, the only thing I have at hand to press it is my book of Mary Oliver poems. Who made the world, she writes. Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? Tell me, she says, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? There are simply no bigger questions than these, than the ones that Mary Oliver asks, and what my time with the men at the mountain gave me, and what Unitarian Universalism gives me every day. Every day is not just words, but an experience, an experience. And I lay that experience down as an answer, as an answer. I am so grateful. Right upon this, I place my prism of fall color, my fantastic leaf, and I close the book. 